Hi, guys. Um, I'm going to be talking about, uh, as okay, George just introduced my title, so that's actually fine. <laughs> um, so what are plastic globules? Plastic globules are uh, plastid lipoprotein particles uh, that are surrounded by a lipid monolayer membrane. I need this, I just realized. Um, as you can see here, in chloroplasts, they are attached to the thylakoid membrane. So what do they do? They play a variety of roles in plastid biogenesis, senescence, homeostasis, and abiotic stress response. Um, as you can see here in these pictures of the chloroplast, they're these little tiny dark spots, and they swell up in response to light stress. They've also been shown to respond to nitrogen deprivation. So combined, the three projects I will discuss today will help us understand the molecular function of plastoglobule proteins and the function of plastoglobules as a whole. Given the breadth of processes plastoglobules are involved in, um, improving the understanding of plastoglobules and the proteins within them uh, may lead to opportunities to target the plastoglobule for genetic modification for crop species. So, plastoglobules contain a proteome of about 30 proteins. In my research this summer, I focused on ABC1 atypical kinases, specifically K1, K3, and K6, and I focused on these three because they frequently co-express with each other, which suggests that they could be related in function. The molecular function of these kinases is, is currently unknown, though they're clearly important as mutations um, in these proteins cause, or in these genes, cause various deleterious phenotypes. <laughs> so pictured here are the results from a previous study in which wild-type and mutant Arabidopsis were grown under varying light conditions. You can see here that under low light, the mutants are just the same as uh, the wild-type phenotype, but under high light stress, the mutants, their leaves turn white and they just completely die. It's also been shown that some combinations of uh, mutant genes result in reduced photoautotrophic ability. Without sucrose supplementation, you can see here that the K1, K6 mutant has pale leaves and the K3, K6 mutant just is seedling lethal. However, with so sucrose supplementation, the K1, K6 looks about the same as the wild type phenotype and the K3, K6 is actually able to grow. Additionally, um, K3, K6 and the triple mutant K1, K3, K6 are not able to reproduce. We see here that the K3, K6 mutant just likes to sit around and doesn't bolt. This one is 112 days old in this picture. <laughs> um, and the triple mutant bolts quickly, but it does not produce viable flowers. They just turn white and just kind of dry out. So with all that background in mind, I'm going to discuss my three summer projects. Uh, investigating the dosage effects of the genes, the mutant genes K1, K3, and K6. Uh, rescuing K6 mutants with the wild type K6 gene. And determining working conditions for immunoblotting with the K6 antibody. Uh, these first two projects will help us better understand the function of these elusive ABC1K, while the latter will help us optimize their detection. So. All the work I've discussed so far has explicitly been on uh, homozygotes, uh, or homozygous mutants, I suppose. In this project, I will ask what phenotypes heterozygous mutants will show and if there are heterozygous combinations, specifically of K3, K6, and K1, K3, K6, that can be grown adequately for molecular study, because we saw that those didn't survive well previously. So what did I do? First, I sowed seeds on various uh, I sowed seeds of various mutant phenotypes of Arabidopsis on media plates with sucrose. If you'll recall, the sucrose is necessary such that some uh, seedlings will not survive without it. Next, I made phenotypic observations of the seedlings as they grew. I was looking for their leaf color and the germination ratio. And next, I extracted genomic DNA from the seedlings and performed um, genotyping PCR to determine what genotypes they actually were. I then moved the seedlings to soil and made more phenotypic observations. I was looking for um, if they could survive without the sucrose supplement, their leaf color, will they bolt, and will they produce viable flowers? And lastly, um, we'll collect seeds from the plants that do manage to produce them, and those seeds can be used for future work. So what did we find? So the, the plants that are homozygous for K1 and K6 and heterozygous for K3, that's a mouthful, um, have shown they have green leaves and high germination. One of them actually bolted this week. You can see that guy right here. Um, so these guys are doing pretty well. They've been on soil for about two weeks and they're surviving just fine. Um, and they look pretty comparable to wild type at this point. 
Uh, it still remains to be seen if they can actually viably reproduce, but that is the hope. <laughs> um, on the other hand, the homozygous for K3 and K6 and heterozygous for K1 mutants are not looking so good. On sucrose, they showed pale cotyledons and slowed growth, and now that they've been moved to soil, they're looking a little bit worse for the wear, as you can see right here. Um, we assume they'll probably be dead soon, simply because uh, we know that the K3, K6 mutant also cannot survive on soil, so why would this one? And then finally, um, unfortunately, none of my first batch of seedlings were K6 heterozygous, which is very unfortunate because I really wanted to study those. Um, <laughs> but so to remedy that, I recently sowed a new batch of seeds, which presumably should be K6 heterozygous. Uh, so these guys are growing right here. Uh, right now they look pretty comparable to wild type. They were sown directly on soil rather than on sucrose, and they're doing pretty well. So it remains to be seen if they continue to do well and if they can reproduce, but that's for our future work. Um, so we need to obviously genotype these K6 hetero seedlings because we need to confirm they, that they are in fact K6 heteros, I guess, um, and just continue to observe, will the plants continue to survive and will they be able to produce uh, viable flowers and seeds? So while this first project focuses on studying the phenotypes that result from non-functional ABC1K, uh, my second project this summer approaches the task of determining ABC1K function from a molecular standpoint. So it has not yet been confirmed that the um, insertion in the K6 gene is what causes the mutant K6 uh, uh, phenotype. Uh, so I set out to uh, test this by cloning a wild type copy of the K6 gene into a K1, K6 mutant uh, in an attempt to rescue the phenotype, so to speak. I also added a C-terminal strep tag uh, to the K6 gene, and that will test if, and I will test if that has an effect on the phenotype. Uh, the strep tag system is just a method to detect proteins. So what did we do? I extract, I, I began by extracting genomic DNA from wild type Arabidopsis, and then I performed PCR in order to isolate and amplify K6 with and without a strep tag. This gene was later inserted into a plasmid, so I designed primers such that an overhang was added to the K6 gene that complements the plasmid it would be inserted into. I then performed a topocloning reaction into the, um, to insert K6 into an, an entry vector. And then I performed, uh, concurrently, I used, case, uh, I used PCR to isolate K6's promoter region and uh, add two different restriction sites to the end of K6. And then I used restriction enzymes to cut K6, or K6, K6's promoter, and also the, um, the destination vector, PMDC201, and ligate the promoter into the destination vector. Um, unfortunately, this was as far as I got on this project this summer, because I had two other projects going on at the same time, but I'll still continue to outline the rest of what I did. So I also performed, or, a LR recombinase reaction will be performed um, in order to uh, transfer K6 and K6 strep into the destination vector just behind the K6 promoter. And then uh, that plasmid will be transformed into agrobacterium. And finally, um, wild type and K1, K6 mutant Arabidopsis will be transformed via floral dip. Transformed Arabidopsis will then be grown on media lacking sucrose. And as you may recall, the K1, K6 seedlings will show um, they'll have pale leaves if grown uh, on media without sucrose. So if the rescue is successful, the uh, mutants should look indistinguishable from wild type. Oh, wrong button. <laughs> so once the wild type K6 rescue has uh, been confirmed, we will use this system um, to test if certain conserved autophosphorylation domains are important for K6 function. This will be tested by introducing point mutations in the K6 gene I isolated, and then attempting to rescue K1, K6 mutants with uh, the mutated K6 gene. So finally, I worked on determining the working conditions for immunoblotting with the K6 antibody. As you may be familiar, immunoblots, uh, also known as Western blots, check for the presence of a specific protein within a sample. Uh, my goal for this project was to determine if we can detect K6 in, uh, or the K6 protein in thylakoid protein extract, or even better, total soluble protein extract. Um, we know that we can use the antibody to detect uh, K6 in plastoglobular protein, but it's just, it's such 
a long process to extract plastic globule protein. You don't want to do it. Um, so we, we would much prefer not to. Total soluble protein is much easier. So I used uh, wild type and K6 mutant Arabidopsis for thylakoid protein extraction and total soluble protein extraction. Um, and then I ran each sample with 10, 20, and 50 micrograms, as shown right here, um, of protein. And the immunoblotting results, as I'm sure you can see, are very, very ugly. There is a ton of nonspecific binding here. So, for your viewing pleasure, <laughs> I've artistically recreated the bands present on the film. I have the film in question uh, with me today, so if anyone doubts these results, whoops, if anyone doubts these results, I would be more than happy to take the film up to the light with you and look at it. Anyway, we know to expect uh, the K6 bands to be right here at 87 kilodaltons. And uh, in this plot, as you can see, I've, I've even circled it. Um, there's lots of great signal, great dark signal, from uh, the wild-type thylakoid samples and also the wild-type total soluble protein samples, which is wonderful. This means we don't have to extract from plastic globules to check if there's uh, K6 protein in a sample. Amazing. A plus. Great. Uh, though there was something else interesting we were noticing about this immunoblot. And that was, as you may have noticed as well, um, there are these faint bands present in some of the mutant samples, and why would those be there? They shouldn't be making that protein. Upon closer examination, however, you can see that these faint bands are also present in the wild-type samples, which makes us think that they are just nonspecific binding occurring to another protein that is not the K6 protein, but is very ever so slightly smaller than the K6 protein. Oh, whoop. Um, so thus, I've determined what one can expect when immunoblotting with the K6 antibody, and that we're free to use total, total soluble protein extraction to our heart's content, which is so much easier. So in summary, while studying the dosage effects for various ABC1K, I may have found a triple mutant, the K1, K6 homozygous, K3 heterozygous, um, that can grow well enough for molecular study. It's doing well on soil right now, though it remains to be seen if it can viably reproduce. Additionally, I worked on the preliminary steps in uh, testing if a K1, K6 mutant can be rescued by transformation with the, K1, or with the wild type K6 gain. And finally, I've uh, optimized the procedure for immunoblotting with the K6 antibody, which will allow for faster and more efficient detection of the K6 protein. I'd like to thank everyone in my lab for being so wonderful and supportive. Uh, specifically, I'd like to thank my PI class and my mentor, Elena. Um, I'd also like to thank Delaney and George for organizing this program, um, the USDA and NSF for funding me, and Cornell for having me. And I will now take questions. Let me figure out how to go back to those slides. One second. Do I, how can I get this back into, I'm so sorry. That one? Gorgeous, okay. Yep. So, um, well actually I suppose I should. So um, there are a variety of uh, different ABC1K. I only went over three of them, but uh, there's also mitochondrial um, ABC1K. Specifically, we know that there's um, K13, which is in mitochondria. There's a homolog of uh, that specific kinase in yeast, and previous work um, with that yeast has shown, um, or with that protein in yeast has shown um, that the specific domains that we're trying to disrupt are important for function and will prevent um, the rescue, basically. Anyone else? Yes. Could you repeat your question? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. So, so do you think your phenotype is entirely due to disrupting possible function, or do you think the mechanisms are involved in other processes? Um, 
Um, I believe the plastiglobules I'm working with are localized, or the plastiglobules, the kinases I'm working with are localized to the plastiglobule. Um, so I would imagine that they are mostly involved in plastiglobule function. Uh, the thylakoid, um, here, let me go back to my first slide. So uh, the thylakoid isn't quite part of the plastiglobule. I, maybe there's some exchange between, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, it's, it's, they're attached, but they're not necessarily the same thing. I do not know. So thank you. Sure. Oh wait. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>